I am little hesitant to talk about that subject, you know, mm-hmm. because you know I'm not a legal scholar. Uh, neither, you know, is Professor Coates. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, we borrow that term from the literature. Uh, there the is, uh, I think, a growing mm-hmm. literature talking about rule of law versus rule uh, by law. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, um, China certainly does not is not a rule. It doesn't have what we call what you know here we rule of law. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's not saying that China does not have any legal system. Mm-hmm. Um, but the way it works is very different from you know what is understood as you know democracy, uh, rule of law, and so on and so forth. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, I, I'm jump. Uh, uh, I'm jumping ahead of myself because th- th- this question is supposed to come later. But um, I, 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 in our previous uh, pre-interview, we talked about. Uh, um, the like a, the case of Microsoft, even a big multinational company like Microsoft, when they had software infringement issue. Uh, my understanding is from, from an economist friend of mine, uh, Microsoft went through the the court system, and I think they either lost or didn't get the result they want, but they didn't appeal, and they end up having to settle out of court. So, and my my thinking is, gee, I mean. Even if Microsoft couldn't go through the legal system to get what they probably deserve or what they want, uh, what is the chance of a small or medium-sized company? You can have all the intellectual property protection you want, but the justice system, the judicial system, is not going to back you up. Then, like, uh, how is that going to jive in uh, in the economic uh, system? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I- I think our take is slightly different from yours uh, on this issue. Um, we don't we don't think uh, you know. Professor Coase told me many times about you know his experience in 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 Britain uh, and how it was so different from American case, particularly terms in terms of the role of law in the economy. Uh, America, I guess, has more lawyers, you know, per capita than any other country. Yeah, true. Uh, but you know, going through a legal case is very expensive, mm-hmm. and uh, so it's very understandable that you know companies as powerful as you know uh, uh, Microsoft, mm-hmm. you know, chose not to go to the, the court. And particularly in China, of course, it's not just, you know, that is expensive, Mm -hmm. but the local governments always tend to favor their own, you know, companies. Mm -hmm. So, um, but isn't that the problem? Like uh, Microsoft, isn't it my point? Microsoft, they are big. They can, they can uh, uh, through their legal department or through their international influence, uh, 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 they are a prominent company. They can get sort of a semi-just, uh, just, semi-just uh, solution for them. But for a small company, the local government that you, you just mentioning, well, the court is not going to be <laughs> too, uh, too linear or too cooperative with them, right? And then, I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go, go, go ahead. Yeah, so the court is not going to help, and then the local government probably can ignore them too. So they 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 are no no win for them, right? I I, I totally agree with your on the last point. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the law does not help people much, mm-hmm. and in most cases, it may work as a barrier for them. Uh, but you know, in most cases, uh, you know, business uh, disputes are settled out of the court. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, you know, I know a lot yeah. of uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know business friends. You know, they are not you know big, big companies. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they just saying you know stay away from the court. I mean, this court is uh, you know not only expensive, but you know you can get into trouble. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. if you can find other long legal you yeah. know uh, way to solve yeah. your you know disputes. That's the way to go. Yeah. Stay away from the court. Yeah. Oh, as a friend of mine, he, he has a business at one time. Uh, I, uh, my take from that is actually stay lucky. He had one time had a problem of collecting bad debts uh, from from uh, people that buy his stuff. <laughs> he went to try to collect. Well, 
police or some other people came, he decided not a good idea to try to collect and then leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but I do want to point out, you know, I do have I know friends in like workers, lawyers in China. Mm. The the number of cases has gone up, you know, dramatically. Mm. So there are more people going to court. Uh, I guess as the economy becomes more and more, you know, privatized, you know, uh, it's just inevitable. You're going to, at some point, uh, you're forced to go to the court to mm -hmm. seek, uh, you know, help. Mm -hmm. So your, 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 you and uh, Professor Coe's feeling is, in the longer run, uh, the court system is going to be more reliable in the sense of uh, providing a fair and just equitable uh, solution. In the at least in the case of uh, business dispute, maybe, maybe should I say we certainly think this is something the Chinese government need to work on um, to improve on. This is a very uh, very good question, uh, but I you know I cannot address it uh, fully in the time that we have. Hmm. Uh, a lot of talking in China now about China being unique. Mm -hmm. So those universal values not applicable to China. And in China, there is an ongoing debate on this issue. Um, but I think... Um, it's almost an excuse, right? I mean, sometimes it's almost viewed as an excuse. Well, China is so unique. Eh, it's not, not, it can't apply to us. Right, right, right. You know, sometimes I guess that 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 part of the reason. But some, I guess, be, I think there is a a common misunderstanding about what makes say, certain values universal. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 this is so. This is very complicated. Let me say. Um, one. The, 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 let me start by saying that a lot of values today we think originated in the West. Like freedom, like democracy, uh, like rule of law, so on and so forth, they are not uniquely Western values. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think Amartya Sen made a good point um, that if you go back, you know, he gave examples, I think, some African countries, you know, how African tribal societies were governed before their encounter with, you know, Western power. Mm -hmm. You know, you can easily identify the, you know, the, they didn't, of course, use the, those same names, but you can find the similar spirit of, you know, uh, freedom, uh, rule, uh, democracy, participatory rule, uh, governance, um, and, uh, um, and, and, and going back to, to, to China, for example, uh, um, China is, is, is so, Complex has such a long history, such a uh, so it's you can say you know authoritarianism that's the Chinese tradition, mm -hmm. but on the other hand you could easily identify the inspirations for freedom and for rule of law in in, in Chinese tradition. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm now writing a, a piece. Uh, I quoted the one from from Confucius. Um, you know, Confucius talking about um, what is called Tian Xia Wei Gong, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's uh, you know, what is under heaven is for the public. Mm -hmm. That teaching, you know, picked up by Kang Yu Wei and uh, uh, Dr. Sun, Sun, Sun Jia Shen. Mm -hmm. And uh, later justified, used to justify public ownership. Mm. But that, that's, that's a very... Uh, I think uh, that, that, that I, I think that's a wrong interpretation of Tian Xia Wei Gong. Mm -hmm. If you look at another saying of Confucius, he said, "Zhen zhe, zhen ye," that is to to govern. The, the way to govern is is integrity, mm -hmm. and that is the government. The, the, the power holders should be impartial, and should should be fair, and uh, is not you know taking the Say you know the uh, the the, the Tisha as as his own, but that's that's for the public. Mm -hmm. So that's very much resembling what you know Adam Smith called you know impartial spectator. Mm -hmm. So I mean, so so tradition itself is very plural, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and uh, you know universal values. 
they are mm-hmm. i mean what makes them universal is, is exactly they can they have wider applicable applicability mm-hmm. so maybe in different time in different history and why not those value exists it's just that it may not be universal right now is that the dis- uh, distinction that we can draw what we have to be let me to be a little bit specific since there are many many universal values say mm-hmm. let's talk about freedom for example mm-hmm. economic just talk about economic freedom right uh, you know under socialism right e- economic freedom does not exist you do, they don't need you know economic freedom under socialism if, mm-hmm. you know uh, we know now we know better Mm-hmm. And uh, you know that system just, just doesn't work. You need to allow economic freedom mm-hmm. for any system to to you know to 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 survive. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, you may have very different institutional arrangements to realize economic freedom. You know, certain different countries may have different arrangements. Different times have different arrangements. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know you need to have economic freedom. Period. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's the it's our history or the different path that each country takes that shapes our law and then which sh- shapes the the economic uh, environment, which I guess in turn in, in, affect each other. Right. We we make a we make a we we emphasize the point that we need to. Take history very very seriously, mm-hmm. and the, the the early Chinese government, particularly Mao, made a terrible mistake, ignoring Chinese history. Mm-hmm. And you know he had this idea. You know we quoted that at the beginning, at the end of our book. He had a talk with Liang Shuming, who is a great you know uh, Confucius scholar. Mm-hmm. Mao and most of his you know most uh, uh, of Chinese leaders of his generation thought. You know, after the founding of the PRC, that China could move ahead quickly just by following socialism. Mm. And you know, Chinese history, to their eyes, was a barrier, was a, was a burden for for China. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, the Chinese Communists, you know, the Mao, b- brought up in a time when Chinese tradition was very much attacked. As a barrier, as a burden, as bad for China. Mm-hmm. Now we, th- I think we know better now. I mean, you cannot build a China without without any without a, without a, a solid foundation, mm-hmm. and the foundation has to be built upon what China has in the past. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not a process of, of course, you know, just imitating or, or, or just copying the past. You cannot do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the past has to be integrated. Mm-hmm. Uh, with you know what you learn today, mm-hmm. and what you learn by yourself, and what you learn from other people around mm-hmm. the around the globe. Yeah, and China mm-hmm. now is as globally engaged as it can be. Mm-hmm. So uh, we are you know we are quite uh, uh, optimistic that China be able to you know transform its history in a way that allow it to be globally engaged and to learn from you know everyone in 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 the, in the world. One point we made in the book uh, was this idea of you know what we call the marginal revolutions. Mm-hmm. You know today, particularly not only in China but also here, that you know people take the Chinese government or the you know Communist Party uh, as the designer architect mm-hmm. of reform. Mm-hmm. But that's not the case if you go back to you know to examine what Deng Xiaoping said at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he didn't know what you know China what to do. What you know, um, so it's uh, as as we detailed in the book, it's it's marginal revolutions. Mm-hmm. It's you know private farming in China, in rural China, you know township and village enterprises in rural China. That is that started to bring private sector and the market forces in 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 rural China, and then at the same time you had uh, uh, what it was called. Um, like you know, youth waiting to be employed. Right, right. You know, they didn't have have a job. They just mm-hmm. came back from countryside, and millions of them 
Mm-hmm. So the Chinese government uh, allowed uh, self-employment, mm-hmm. and that that was the beginning of the rise of a private sector in the in in Chinese cities. Mm-hmm. And quickly they become they show they can make money, mm-hmm. and started to attract more and more people to join them. So that's the start of a private sector outside the state control in in rural in, in urban China. Mm-hmm. And so it's you know it's so that's why. You know, we are so we become more optimistic. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like you know the Chinese government. You know, we have a you know a wise leader who you know see better than anyone else and designed some kind of a you know like magic roadmap mm-hmm. you know, that allowed China to be transformed. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the Chinese parents, is the Chinese you know um, employed people. You see. Is those marginalized the workers, the peasants marginalized under socialism. They just wanted to have a better life, mm-hmm. to have to be able to feed them, to feed their families. It's their attempts that led to you know the market transformation. Mm-hmm. So the marginalized so, so, revolutions is one thing that you and Professor Coase, uh, through research and empirical findings and what was. Confirm, hey, that actually was different from everyone else was thinking. Hey, it's top down and whatnot. Yeah. Right, right. If you, for example, if you look at you know 2008, that regarded as the 30th anniversary of reform. Mm-hmm. Even look at what the Chinese government said. It's all about you know our party did this, our government that mm-hmm. you know did that. You know that led to re- to the success of reform. Mm-hmm. But if you go back, you know, to the early 80s to look at you know, people's daily. You know, that's not what they said at that time, mm-hmm. and they just didn't know what to do. And allowed mm-hmm. people to try, give people freedom, give local authorities freedom, and encouraging them to try. Mm-hmm. That's how reform got started. Mm-hmm. And you know, I hope this lesson. You know, uh, the, the, I hope the Chinese government or, or the Chinese people will not, you know, uh, uh, forget about this. How mm-hmm. how reform you know started, mm-hmm. and they got this uh, momentum. Well, there's so there, there, first there are a lot of facts we don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, do, look at Shenzhen, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, this is is a great you know success, and it was a, a small town, or even like a village, you know, before reform, mm-hmm. and the economy was so bad that you know a lot of people tried their best, you know, uh, go to Hong Kong to have mm-hmm. a better life. And uh, suddenly now it's the third or you know fourth largest city in China with a booming economy. Mm. How did that happen? And mm. you know if you look at the official account. Mm. You know it's like you know all the Beijing started to have this special economic zone, and, and then it's more it's it's like it's a, it's like a, you know we had this design and then got it implemented, then it yeah. succeeded. Mm-hmm. That's not that's not the case, mm-hmm. and um, you know we we have I I have not seen really good detailed accounts of mm-hmm. the success of Shenzhen, mm-hmm. and you know that stories you know uh, mm-hmm. you can talk about the window model, and the window was a great success again. Sorry, the what the model? So Shenzhen, uh, that would be one great area to study. What is the other one? Let's get. The other one is 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 called Wenzhou. Wenzhou. Oh, okay, I got it. Sorry, yeah, Wenzhou. That's a, that's a great story. Again, mm-hmm. I mean, we we know. I think we know more actually about about Wenzhou than Shenzhen, mm-hmm. uh, because uh, there are a lot of scholars in uh, in Zhejiang. They uh, you know they have written a lot about Wenzhou, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, you know this can uh, can um, uh, contrast between what is called the Zhejiang model. Versus, you know, uh, Sulam model or Jiangsu model. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that that's not we need to know about. You know, what makes the window model works? And the today, window is not in a in a in a in a, in a great. What is not in a position? Mm-hmm. Uh, window window now is not as competitive as it was before. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I, now, what what is uh, Wenzhou specialized in, or what what do they famous for? Like I know Shenzhen is a lot of factories and one other Hong Kong influence, but is it Wenzhou. Wenzhou was, I think, Wenzhou had a, had uh, when 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 reform started. Wenzhou was one of the poorest areas in mm-hmm. in Zhejiang. 
uh, in the 80s, 90s, you know, it quickly became the the leading, I guess, region in, in reform. Uh, you know, private sector started there because they didn't have a public sector to talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was very poor. Uh, if you look at the, the land re- people ratio, is very bad. Mm-hmm. And it didn't have any like resources. The only thing they had was people. Mm-hmm. And they allowed people to try, you know, uh, private business, uh, private farming, you know, pri- and when the people, when uh, they were forced to go out, to go to other parts of China, to go other parts of the world, to, to, to have, a, you know, to be able to feed themselves. Mm-hmm. So when there was never, like, as controlled by the state as the other part of, 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 of China. Uh, so, uh, and of course, now people point to early history of China, of, of Wenzhou, like in the uh, Qin Ming time, they had a very private, uh, very strong um, uh, commercial tradition, mm-hmm. and uh, that certainly helped. Mm-hmm. But still, I mean, when I in the eight in the eighties, for example, mm-hmm. it take hours or even days for people to get from Wenzhou to to Hangzhou. That's the capital mm-hmm. of of, of Zhejiang province, mm-hmm. and the, the the transportation was as primitive mm-hmm. as like you know thousand years ago. Mm, wow! Mm-hmm. But it became the center, like mm-hmm. the like retail center in mm-hmm. in China. Mm-hmm. And there you and and manufacturing going on the very mm-hmm. strong. Mm-hmm. They, and they didn't have you know any particularly if you compare winter with with uh, with Jiangsu with. Uh, mm-hmm. Wuxi, for example, Wuxi had a lot of township and village enterprises at the very beginning because it was close to Shanghai, to other big cities. Wendu had nothing, had no industrial base. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it became, now it's still, I think it's still very strong. But in the 80s and the 90s, it was the center, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. So if I get the gist right, is uh, like you and Professor Ko would love to see more of uh, empirical studies of those regions where how and what they did well to to become successful and and to to get a better understanding instead of just uh, I guess in hindsight uh, and say uh, well we did this and that and that happened well it's not really like that <laughs> right one in, today you can you know you, you if you look at GDP data you know China is doing great if you can look at the growth data China is doing great mm. but those data. Well, those numbers are created at you know why you know, what forces mm. drive the growth of the econ- the Chinese economy that mm. allow us to see those good numbers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you do, so for example, look at the, the automobile industry. Well, I mean, China now, China, the, the, you know, uh, the, the the domestic firms was were, were doing okay, but not mm-hmm. as good as the you know. The uh, uh, the uh, international, you know, the American firms, uh, the, the Toyota, you know, the, the Korean firms. Mm-hmm. But again, I mean, you know, if you look at the, uh, the the growth of the automobile industry in China, it it started from a base really that there was no base to talk about. Mm-hmm. China, of course, had you know what is it called number one uh, Yichi, number one car manufacturer, um, well, that's in Changchun, and number two in, 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 in Xi'e, and that's in Hubei. Um, but now, you know, automobile in the firms everywhere in China. And mm. how did that industry start? And how, you know, the automobile industry is very complicated. Mm. And you, they have a lot, you know, the big firms, have, they, have a, they rely upon numerous, you know, tiny suppliers Mm -hmm. and how that kind of coordination, you know, uh, you know, was managed. Mm -hmm. And uh, now more and more in in, in, at the beginning, say, uh, uh, Ford, for example, they would rely heavily on foreign firms to supply, you know, components to them. Right, foreign firms. Yeah. Yeah, now more and more is done by local Chinese firms. Mm-hmm. You know, how did the technology, how did knowledge transfer from the foreign firms to domestic firms? Mm-hmm. And how, you know, you have this great, you know, there are a number of Chinese domestic firms mm-hmm. are doing 
pretty, you know, impressive mm -hmm. in China. Would, would it be part of like the technology transfer requirement? Like foreign company, yeah, you come, but then there's a, a schedule of transferring technology. Like you kind of you teach us, and then once we learn it, you're gone. <laughs> Is that well, it, it's not that easy. You can have that requirement. Mm -hmm. But you know, people that, that you you, you don't you don't work that way. You, oh, you cannot, yeah. right? Sure. Yes, you know, particularly given the fact that you know China that you know eighties they they didn't I and mean, they didn't they were not as exposed to modern industry as they are today. Mm -hmm. uh, but they pick up pretty quickly. You, you for example, another good example is to look at the. Uh, uh, the the uh, the lighters the da huo ji, right? You know, for you know for quickly the Chinese firms you know dominated the the the, the uh, you know the business. Mm -hmm. uh, you know in the seventies and the sixties, you know it, uh, the the Korean firms the Japanese firms oh, dominated the industry, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that industry was so small it was like a tiny industry so no mm -hmm. state enterprises got involved as oh. far as I. It all done by firms in Wenzhou. Oh, I see. Wow, interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, as I said, there's a, there's a lot. You know, we can do. You know, um, country. We are going to case studies on the local level. We can look at you know how Shenzhen, how Wenzhou developed, how Zhejiang developed. Mm. We can look at you know individual industries, mm -hmm. how they evolved and how they keep evolving. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's you know that's why we say you know we are just at the very beginning of trying to understand, you know, China's market economy.